a typical leader starts with today and sort of extrapolates forward into what might be in the future. Here's what needs to be put in place to kind of accommodate that. And that's much more reactive than a leader who says, I'm going to start with three to five years out, right? And this is where I think we could be. Then I'm going to work backward and say, well, if that's where we want to be, these are the absolutely essential things. Welcome to The Thinking Leader, brought to you by Red Team Thinking. Bad leaders react, good leaders plan, and great leaders think. Each week, you'll get new ideas and insights from business executives, military experts, and innovative thought leaders to help you lead more effectively and better navigate your complex world. Now, here are your hosts, best-selling business author and top-rated leadership speaker, Bryce Hoffman, and former RAF Wing Commander and Business Agility Coach, Marcus Dimbleby. Hello and welcome to the show once again. Great to have you all joining us and listening in. Bryce, hello, my friend. How are you? Hello, Marcus. I am good. I'm excited. We have a wonderful guest this week. Rita McGrath is on the faculty at Columbia Business School. She's the author of several books, including one that I really like called Scene Around Corners. And she's a partner in the company Belize with one of our former guests, Ron Bohr, who a lot of you listened to and liked, that uh, helps companies innovate and transform. And most exciting of all, she's working on a new book right now that I just love the title. The permissionless organization is what she's conceiving of. So a lot to unpack there. Rita, welcome to the show. A pleasure to be here. I'm so glad we finally made this happen. Yes. So, so many places that we could dive in here. Let's talk about your, your, your latest book, Seen Around Corners. Can you tell folks a little bit about what that's about? Sure. So Seeing Around Corners was actually inspired by Andy Grove's work back in the 90s on strategic inflection points. And as he put it, a strategic inflection point is something that creates a 10x change in what's possible. So 10x faster, 10x cheaper, 10x more convenient. Um, and I didn't know what to do with the concept for years. I mean, I, I, it, I, I loved it. It sort of burbled around my head. But if, if you have this thing that just comes out of nowhere and uh, uh, takes you by surprise, like, well, what do you do with that strategically? And then a friend sent me an article. And the article was called, What If You Changed the World and Nobody Noticed? And the core story in the article was about the Wright brothers' invention of manned flight. And this is a big deal, right? I mean, human beings have wanted to be birds as long as we've been human beings. (laughs) You know, we get ticked off and we can't fly. Um, And so you would think the world would react with just amazement and shock and awe and everything would be different. So next day in the paper, very small mention. Next month in the paper, no mentions. Next year, nothing. Two years, nothing. It took until five years after the 1903 demonstration that this could be possible, that before any major newspaper took it seriously. And this then became the crystallizing seed for the book, which is when you think about inflection points, they feel as though they came out of nowhere. But when you actually look at how they evolve, It's a lot like the old Hemingway story. You know, how did you go bankrupt? Well, two ways, gradually and then suddenly. And (laughs) two with inflection points. And so the beauty of it is if you attune yourself to pick up on the weak signals, if you are open to the information that maybe is a little hard to get, if you're willing to be candid about what's going on in the world, you can actually be tracking these things as they emerge. And then when it finally passes the threshold, you can be ready to take your business to the next height. Well, I I love this idea, Rita. And I think we've seen this play out in the past six months with AI. I mean, you have this concept that has been percolating out there. In, in, I mean, it's been there obviously for decades going all the way back to, to, you know, certainly to, to Turing and stuff like that. But I mean, in earnest, it's been kind of percolating for the past decade. And then suddenly, with chat GPT, it becomes real. And obviously people who are working in this area, it was real a lot longer before that, but it, it, it kind of takes that moment for it to move from something that is, you know, and I, I think the Wright brothers is a great example because I know there's a, they were during those three years, they were corresponding with other people working on flight and stuff that wasn't unknown in this very small niche community globally of, of people who are trying to figure out how, how to do heavier than air flight. 
But outside of that, it was. And this, I, I think ChatGPT is really kind of a modern example of that. Absolutely. And it's interesting because if you think about that, think about the advantage of the people who um, were able to, well, not people so much as, as, as VCs that were able to invest in, you know, uh, open AI, for instance, because they saw what was coming. Um, I'm sure those people are, are the, the, those, those venture firms are, are going to be getting huge dividends for seeing the potential of what they were doing before anyone else did. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it's important that leaders learn how to see this in their own organizations too. Um, and I think that's, you know, rather than reacting, getting ahead of the curve, I mean, that's what, that's the, the, the tagline of our, our show that we're doing right here is bad leaders react, good leaders plan and great leaders think. And, and, and the, the, the best thinking you can do is about what the next big thing is going to be and how to Absolutely. take advantage of it. And what's also fascinating is when you ask a group of people in a company and you get them sort of to take some time and you say, what are the big things that are, you know, time zero events of the future? And very often you will get quite a good list, you know, of things that, that might be material, that might matter. Um, and then you say to them, well, how often do you revisit that list? When do you make the time to pay attention to these things? And very often the answer, if, if they're really being honest, is never. Never. It's a one-stop shop. You know, I am so busy with the day-to-day -day and drowning in my emails and dealing with the deliverables and feeding the beast in today's crisis. I just never take that time. And yet it doesn't take that much time. I mean, if you allocate, right. say, a couple of hours a month to thinking about that future orientation, it can be remarkably effective. If Absolutely. The time, though. That's the key, isn't it? And we talk about this a lot, don't we, Bryce, about people are so busy that just taking two hours out, and when you look through executive diaries and that's something I play is hunt the white space and go through their diaries and you get white space to quickly red face because they're blocked seven till seven, five days a week, six days a week sometimes. So when you say to them, hey, how about taking two hours out for reflection and thinking? They look at you as if well, that's impossible. You know, so how have you found that? Greek? And, I, and I love the title of seeing around corners. I think many executives struggle to see the corner because they're trying to plan so far ahead. Mm -hmm. And in today's complex world, that horizon has to come much closer because it it's adaptive and reactive because that's the nature of the beast. So how are you see, seeing- See, I don't think they are planning. I, I, I want to jump in there. I don't think they are planning or the far ahead at all. No, no they're not. I think they're, they're looking to. at, I think, I think they're, I, I don't think they're, I think they're looking at where their foot is right now. You don't ever think they're looking up? They don't Naval even know there's gazing. a corner coming because they're looking right where their feet are right now. I, wi I wish <laughs> oh, I'll give them some more credit than that, but no, you're probably right. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I think that you, that, that, that what you're talking about here though is so key because if you don't take the time to look up mm. from your work, which is what you're talking about there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we had a, a guest on several months ago, Mick Paisley, um, who, who's, uh, uh, CTO with with a uh, uh, cybersecurity company, I believe, right, Marcus? Yeah, correct. Um, he he spends an hour a day reading. He said, for the, because he knows that if he doesn't, his employees will will be way past where he's at in understanding. Okay. And if he wants to be able to just simply manage his team effectively, he needs to invest that time in being aware of what's new and what's what's coming. And I think that's so true of every leader. I mean, I, but, but it is a challenge. I mean, I, I set that goal for myself and I don't do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So how do you, how do you, you help leaders uh, find that time, Rita? What do you, what do you counsel to, the, to them? Well, I counsel them to make that the priority before you let other people put their opportunities on your agenda, right? Um, and so, you know, David Cody, a uh, former CEO of Honeywell had this practice of what he called X days. And he would just mm -hmm. go through his diary and he kept a paper diary and he would just put a great big X on blocks of time uh, to think. And that would be time for doing plant visits or time for staring out the window or time for perhaps talking to some junior people that he might not otherwise, you know, might not otherwise make it through his gatekeepers to get onto his calendar. Um, but he was very deliberate about allocating specific time. Um, you know, people always say to me, well, you know, what's the first thing I should do if I want to make my organization more innovative? And I say, 
you know, look at your calendar, right? Yeah, <laughs> Send right. me the agendas yeah. of, of the last time important people got together to talk about important stuff and tell me where innovation falls. And, and you know, if it's item number 15, right next to sort of operational update number 12, you, you, people know you don't care. You're not, you're not putting your time where you want your organization to go. And if you as the leader don't do that, nobody else is going to, you know, they're not stupid. They're watching and seeing what you pay You set the bar, yeah. Well, you know, Rita, I know you and I are both big fans of Alan Mulally. And, you know, this is something that he understood so clearly. And his BPR process, his weekly meetings, were really part of what they did. Part of it was triaging what needed to be dealt with in the company. And part of it was bringing the senior leadership team together every single week to think and to make decisions. And there's two things that I, I, I would say that out of that. One is, before Alan came to Ford, and I talked with every single, I knew every single member of the senior leadership team at that company before he came and after he came, none of them could remember a time in the previous decade, in the previous decade, where they had all been in the same room together. Wow. <laughs> that tells you all you need to know right there. Global leaders of Ford in, 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 since the beginning of 2000 had not been in the same, well, they'd been at a party, you know, they'd been at like, you know, the holiday party, but in terms of working yeah. meeting, because they couldn't stand each other. And so they just didn't, they just were siloed off and they're doing their own things. Nobody knew what anyone else was doing. The other thing is, you know, I, I, I think back to the, the one person who, as, to, as Alan put it, self-selected off the team early on was the head of Ford's Asia Pacific group. And, you know, when Alan said, we're going to have this weekly meeting to work together as a, as a leadership team to set the strategy and figure out where we're going and make decisions. He said, I don't have time for this. He said, you know, we're, we're, we're the last major automaker into China. We're behind the eight ball. I have to be in Beijing, uh, you know, making nice with the communist party in order to get permission to build another factory and, and get the logistics that we need to, to support the factory we already have. And I will send my teams to tell you what's going on in Asia Pacific, but this is the priority. And Alan looked at me and said, you don't have a bigger priority than running this company. Asia Pacific, all this stuff, these are the details, but running the company, coming together as a senior leader to make decisions about big things that we're dealing with as a company, that's job one. And, you know, they locked turns over this and he ended up leaving. But I think that understanding that, that and, and I'll just say one more Alan thing on this too. You know, his first town hall, the day he was hired, someone from the, the corporate strategy functions, you know, raised her hand and stood up and said, you know, I really hope that you're going to elevate corporate strategy to a, uh, to a more important role now. And he said, well, corporate strategy is important, but then he, waved his hand over the front row of the audience where the entire C-suite was sitting. He said, I have a problem with corporate strategy offices though. He said, because we're the ones who should be doing strategy. Otherwise, why are we getting paid millions of dollars a year? And again, it goes back to that's our, it's your most important job as a leader is thinking. 100%, 100%. And I was looking at, your Sparks sessions. And I, I love talking about these popular management tools where you were saying everybody wants to be the author of this popular tool, as everyone's aware of. And I'm going to write, read a line here. What makes a difference, as with any tool, is the skill of the person using it and the consistency with which you stick to it. How We know, we know that's a major problem. That it's that consistency, that self-discipline, which goes back to the time thing we're talking about goes back to buying into that strategy that Bryce was alluding to there at Ford. How are you, A, seeing leaders finding that time or building in that time and then creating the space, not just for them, but also their team members, their peers, their workforce? Well, again, I think it comes back to clarity of purpose. Um, and I think it also has to do with being quite disciplined, and I mean really mm -hmm. deeply disciplined about what you're not going to do. Um, you know, if I look at the typical C-suite 
person, right? Their, their calendar runs them. They don't run their calendar. And, you know, they don't have that clarity of, of commitment or focus about here's where we want to be in X time. So what I would say is a typical leader, you know, starts with today and sort of extrapolates forward into what might be in the future. And, you know, here's what needs to be put in place to kind of accommodate that. And that's much more reactive than a leader who says, I'm going to start with three to five years out, right? And this is where I think we could be. Then I'm going to work backward and say, well, if that's where we want to be, these are the absolutely essential things. And so a great example of this, um, regardless of what you think of his rather peculiar personality is Elon Musk. I mean, here's a guy running, what, four major companies. He's just announced an AI startup. But in each of those companies, there's this incredible urgency around mission. And there are metrics around time to certain thresholds. For example, for the Tesla company, he has a big metric for what percentage of, of share of all of automobiles in the world are electric, right? Um, and he's going to be a vehicle to, no pun intended, to make that happen. And so there's incredible urgency, incredible clarity of purpose. And and nothing that is not on that roadmap is going to get resources or time on his calendar. And anything that is on that roadmap that's a bottleneck is going to get enormous amounts of urgency and time on his calendar. And I'm not saying we have to be like Elon Musk, but I think that quality of start with the future you want and work backward, that's what you're after. So I like I like the start with the future you want and work backward. But, you know, if you if you're completely lacking in emotional intelligence and and don't recognize that that your people need to be, you need to bring your people along on the journey rather than drag them on dog leashes. Um, it doesn't work very well. I mean, Tesla is kind of a train wreck under the covers. Um, and, and so are a lot of his companies, I think, um, you know, they have their, the, 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 the production quality of their vehicles is, is laughable to most people in the auto industry. Um, the only reason they don't break down on the side of the roads is because there's not a lot of moving parts, you know, but they have, you know, fit and finish and stuff like that. And you, these hemorrhages talent, you know, left and right. How do you, how do you square that circle? How do you, how do you have that discipline, which I agree you need to have that long-term discipline, but do it in a way that doesn't, doesn't leave a kind of flaming trail of destruction behind you? Well, I think um, part of it's what, what it is you want to achieve. And, and you know, there are people who will say working for Musk did burn them out, but it was the biggest growth period of their lives. It allowed them to do things they could never have conceived of doing. So, you know, a lot of these characters, Steve Jobs is another one, you know, they're, they're quite polarizing. And, and I mean, I, I'm very fond of Ben Horowitz's um, distinction between wartime leaders and peacetime leaders, you know, and I think a lot of what we believe about leadership is kind of peacetime leadership, you know, and a great example of this that's being talked about a lot right now is you look at Google, right? I mean, Google's had this money printing business called ads that has not actually required them to make hard decisions or hard choices or do very much that isn't around that business for a long time. So it's kind of peacetime sort of works. And at that point, you know, there's a lot that 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 you can do in terms of being kind to people and 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 whatever it is. Um, but if you're in a perception of wartime, and and Musk seems to be, you know, sense of urgency, we don't have time to waste. You know, there's no time to 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 let go. Um, I think it's a different a different focus that you have as a leader. Um, and and I think Alan's a nice sort of middle ground, right, where. You, People loved working for Alan and loved working with Alan. And, but he had that clarity of focus and he had that real drive. I mean, I think someone described him once as having a titanium spine, you know? <laughs> so. I mean, that's the thing is, I mean, you know, he's someone who is, who, who's the definition of a wartime leader in the sense that he famously saved two iconic companies that were written off by most observers as, 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 as being finished, Boeing and Ford. But he did it without without doing wrecking, wreaking havoc on, on his people. In fact, his, his, as you pointed out, his people loved him. His people would die for him. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I still, I mean, it's been, my gosh, it, it's been, now I feel old. It's been 11 years since, mm -hmm. since my book, American Icon came out. And I still, every month or two, get emails from Boeing employees, not Ford employees, 
from Boeing employees saying, can you tell Alan that he needs to come back to Boeing and save Boeing again, you know, and stuff. And, and I, I, I was talking with a Boeing exec a couple of months ago, and he said that people in his office were crying when Alan left to go to Ford. And, you know, if you're inspiring that type of devotion in your employees and you're leading them through, mm-hmm. that's the thing. I mean, that to me, that's why I think he's such a great model of leadership is because you can do both. Mm-hmm. And I think back, you know, the, the biggest illustration to that, the, the moment that I knew that this guy was something really different was the, was the day after he was hired. Because I was doing the deep dive piece on who is Alan Mulally, and I called up the head of uh, the machinist union that you know was the main union at Boeing, and the the head of the machinist union was saying, "Oh, this guy, he's he we call we called him Alan the Axe Man, you know, and he came at us with a bloody axe, and he 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 cut forty percent of the jobs at Boeing. He was ranting, and he was he was getting all worked up to lather, and without even taking a breath, all of a sudden he said, and it's a goddamn crime that he didn't become CEO of Boeing. And, and I said, whoa, 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 wait, wait a second there. You just told me that this is the guy who came at you with a bloody ax and he cut 40% of your workers and all this stuff. And he's like, well, yeah, but he saved the damn company too. <laughs> and, you know, so, I mean, if, if that's what you inspire in the people who, who, who were at the brunt of the hard decision, Literally you dodged to make, an ax. Yeah. yeah, that's, that's an amazing thing. And I think, you know, to me, this isn't a once in a gener- generation type thing. This is something that I think a lot that leaders can strive to cultivate in themselves too. It's just, it's just about awareness. Mm-hmm. And this goes back and, to what we were talking about earlier and using these tools. We talked about consistency and discipline, but Rita, you also talk about the skill to use it. Mm-hmm. Right. I, I, and personally, I, I think the skill required of modern leaders today is lacking. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, the, a lot of the context is not what got us here will keep us here. It won't. And I think there's a lot of reticence to unlearn. And we work with Barry O'Reilly, writes a great book, Unlearn, about how you have to unlearn a lot of the things because in the past, you know, 20, 30 years, what worked then has so drastically changed now in this digital era that we need to unlearn a lot of that so we don't start repeating those bad habits, but also then start to relearn and learn new things, Mm -hmm. which, you know, and it's specifically men of a certain age are very, loathe to do that because they believe that they know what's going on. They believe they know the company, their sector, et cetera. And I think certainly the executives we work with, the progressives who understand learning, relearning and evolution, not of, not just of themselves, but of their people and invest in their people rather than just technology, just process. They're the ones leaping ahead. So how have you, in the work you're doing, Rita, and the executives you're seeing, where are you seeing this level of learning and skill? to where it is and where do you think it should be and how are how are some of them moving to that that next level to raise their own bar well there's a whole range right i mean any source of human endeavor is going to have levels of capability which differ yeah. um but what i would say is that i think we give a lot of excessive attention to behaviors, right? So if you ask somebody what makes a great leader, and you'll get back this list of, this laundry list of things these leaders do, right? So they're, they exhibit emotional awareness. They're very crisp in their communications. They um, express ambition. They blah, 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 blah. So on the one hand, we're, you know, humble and honest and vulnerable and, you know, whatever. And on the other hand, we're confident and capable and inspiring and move people forward to action. Um, and it's kind of schizophrenic. And so I really like the work of um, Hitendra Wadwa. He's a colleague of mine here at Columbia. And he wrote um, a great book called Inner Mastery, Outer Impact. And his thesis is that our focus on leader behaviors is fundamentally misguided, that instead what we should be thinking about are where are the leaders centered in their core? Like what what do they understand to be true to themselves that's going to be true today and true tomorrow and true for a long time? And then how do they, from that st- stable and very long-lived core, how do they then select which behaviors make sense given what they're trying to achieve in a given interaction? And then how do we determine behaviors that would be uh, helpful? So specific things, um, you know, take a pause before you immediately respond, right? give some thought to who else needs to be in this context to make a successful outcome. You know, prepare. 
Um, and he talks about instead of having like fixed properties, he talks about having core energies of which a sense of purpose, your, your ability to love, you know, your, your, your teams. And Alan talks about this too. I mean, he talks about love and hope, right? Uh, and, uh, and so I think a lot of leaders are kind of uncomfortable with that language because they think it seems sort of squishy. But if you think about, if you think about it as energy rather than a fixed quantity. So if I'm giving you energy and you're more energetic as, as a consequence, that, that, that helps us both, right? Yeah, and what Attender would tell you is he said, you know, different kinds of leaders really elevated certain qualities in others. He said, you know, you could never have a meeting with Winston Churchill without emerging feeling more courageous. You, know, you could not yes. have a meeting with Mother Teresa without emerging feeling more compassionate. And so I think this notion that we have this stable kind of core of things, which then we can be very selective about how we use those, you know, in a given situation. Um, and if you look at the way people describe, for example, Abraham Lincoln, um, and he got a whole just laundry list of people who interacted with him, you would think they were talking about 10 different people. Hundred percent, hundred percent. You know, and, and so I think that that idea that you have to work on this core of who you really are and, and the things like emotional awareness is absolutely a piece of that. Um, yeah. and, and, but then, then be skillful in how you express that in given situations, depending on what it is you're trying to accomplish. You know, another thing I would say, and this comes back to time, is what I see a lot of these executives doing is just rushing from meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting, right? And, you know, they don't take 15 minutes out and say, okay, who's right. gonna be at this meeting? What would a really good outcome look like for this particular meeting? What do I need to be thinking about? And when you think that most leadership advances are not something that happens in one meeting and it's once and done. It's, it's a cumulative series of interactions that, you know, put one put, one foot put, gets put in front of the other. And, and so if you're not giving some thought to, okay, how am I moving like one inch closer or one foot closer to my ultimate goal? And how do I do this in the moment of this meeting? Um, we don't take the time to really be deliberate about that. And so a lot of the time we actually do spend interacting with others is kind of underutilized and kind of a waste. That's, you know, that's why one of the things that we, that we talk to our clients about all the time is decision making needs to be a practice rather than a process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, Rita, one of the things that is one of the biggest red flags for me when I'm working with a client is when I see that they're scheduling calls to the five minute. You know, I get, I get, you know, it ha happened to me last week, an executive that I was talking to, his assistant offered times of like, you know, 220, you know, things like, and to me, that's somebody who is so jamming their schedule together yeah. that they have no time to think. Mm -hmm. They have no time to think, you know, at all. And, you know, it, it, it's, it, it, you're so right when you say it's not, it's not, you're not going to save the company. You're not going to be successful in one meeting. You know, people used to ask me all the time, oh my gosh, Alan must work, you know, around the clock saving Ford Motor Company. So he, he was home, he was home every day by 630. And people would say, how is that even possible? And, and if you ask him, we talked to, he talked on, on this show about that. It's because mm -hmm. my biggest job as the senior leader is to show up the next day ready to to to, yeah. to take on the challenges of the next day and if i'm smiling smiling and if i'm at the office till 11 30 at night every night burning myself out yeah. i'm not doing i'm not doing my job the impact of that yeah it's huge yeah a lot of leaders forget that mm -hmm. a lot of leaders forget that and i, I just want to just come back to something you said that's so interesting because i've actually been thinking about this a lot this concept of you know meeting with Churchill and coming out feeling brave, meeting with Mother Teresa, coming out feeling compassionate. I, I, I've finally done something that I've been meaning to do for decades, which is bite the bullet and read War and Peace cover to cover. And I was fascinated to learn, and I didn't understand until I read this passage, that up until the Russian Revolution, War and Peace was actually a required reading at the Russian military academies because they thought it taught important lessons about how to be a leader during wartime. And there's a, I won't go into all the details, but there's a, a part of the book and it's about a historic Russian general. And, and Tolstoy observes that in the midst of this battle, 
all these different officers are coming to him saying, you know, sir, you know, the French are here and, you know, we need to, you know, rally our, our, our cavalry and, and counterattack here or they're going to turn our line. And, he, and the French are here and, you know, that we're under fire. We need to pull back. And he notices that every single person, this general simply repeats to them what they have just told him they need to do, but in a calm and level-headed tone of voice. And he, the, the character who's observing this watches, who's a staff officer watches and sees how each of these officers instantly calms down, instantly puts their shoulders back and is like, yes, yes, we do need to, to lead our cavalry to do it. Off we go to do that. And they leave inspired. And, and, and he notes that he hasn't made a single decision in the course of this entire battle. What he's done is calm people down, inspired them with courage, listen to them. It's only once where somebody says something that's wrong that he corrects them and off they go to the races. And that is, that's exactly what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And in, 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 in business or that's the same type of thing we need to bring as leaders to business as well. I would agree. So there's a wonderful book uh, called in extremist leadership by uh, Tom Kolitz, which you may be aware oh. of and yeah. um, what Tom talks about. And so, so Tom's position on this, which I think is quite marvelous is he said, you know, most of what we know about crisis is people who for one reason or another actually found themselves in trouble and maybe they got out and maybe they didn't. Um, and then we draw lessons from that. He says, what I was interested in studying was crisis professionals, people who deliberately put themselves in harm's way, knowing yep. it, right? And, and, and are learning the techniques to cope with that, knowing that they're going to go into a crisis. So firefighters and military people and mm -hmm. people that are crisis professionals and, uh, and did a lot of observing. And one of the things he observes is that they bring down the emotional temperature of these exchanges that, you know, like if you yeah. look at the movies, right. And you look at leaders in the crisis in the movies and they're shouting and they're banging telephones and they're, you know, pounding the table with their fists. And Tom was like, that's completely wrong, right? In a crisis, yeah. what the skilled leaders do is they bring down the emotional temperature. They say, let's all take a deep breath. <laughs> let's think about this. The other thing that they do, and I think this is useful for folks that might be listening is they get people focused on something external to themselves. So they say, okay, we're in a dangerous situation for the next two hours. Here's what I need you to do. I need you to take this pencil and move it from here to here and just stay focused on that task. I'll be back at you when, when we know more, right? And so getting people out of that, that period of worry and fear and, and dread, I think is so important. The other thing that I've been researching as part of my new book is how people think about the future and, and orienting themselves towards the future. And there's some very interesting work that's been done by the Institute for the Future where they gamify, oh, yeah. um, you know, they gamify future scenarios, one of which in 2008 was a global pandemic that was a respiratory disease. Um, but here's what's fascinating to me. You would think people anticipating these highly uncertain things, a global plague, a global pandemic, you know, a, a massive issue of some kind. Um, and the researcher that did this, uh, Jane McGonigal is her name, uh, said, you know, I would have thought that putting people in those situations would have made them anxious, would have resulted in negative consequences, would have resulted in them feeling, you know, that hopeless. And she said it was completely the opposite. It turns out human humanity, if we can imagine something and conceive of it and start to plan what we would do in response, and this is back to seeing around corners, right? It turns out we get emotionally released from this dread, right? Mm -hmm. we, it's almost like we have seen the worst that can happen. And you know, we, here's a way out, <laughs> right? Yeah, you move forward with confidence because you've seen it. So true. Well, let's, this is a, such a fascinating conversation. Let's take a short break here. When we come back, Reed, I'd love to dive into the permissionless organization. Stay tuned. Hey folks, Bryce here. If you're listening to this and you're liking what you're hearing and you're wondering, am I a red team thinker? We have an easy way for you to find out. Just go to the show notes, click on the link there to our free assessment to find out if you are a red team thinker and what you can do to think more effectively, to lead more effectively, and to make better decisions faster in your complex world. Like I said, the link is in the show notes, or you can simply go to our website, redteamthinking.com. Check it out. I can't wait to see how you score. Welcome back. Wow. This has just been an amazing discussion, Rita. I, I want to, we could talk about what we've been talking about all day and, I, and 
and we'll have to have you back on and, and talk more about this. But I want to shift to the book you're working on now because I just love this this term, the permissionless organization. What do you mean by the permissionless organization? Well, it refers to techniques and technologies that allow consequential decisions to be made as close to the edges of the organization as possible. So that you have the ability for small teams uh, to, to act in the moment as they feel they should act, which makes the company much more responsive. Um, the trendy way to talk about this is agility, right? But it's, it's, it's more than that kind of, you know, that scaffolding of scrums and all that sort of language that's now gotten kind of, as with many management tools we were just talking about. It's a whole other podcast yeah, right now. Yeah, it kind right. of gets distorted. But um, I think the reality yeah. of it is what technology can do now is actually step in and replace what a lot of management used to be. So in a multi-layered bureaucracy, you know, you had people who were coordinators and they needed to run around with clipboards, metaphorically checking on things and allocating tasks to people and so forth. Whereas if you use technology well and you design the organization right, a couple of things can be done. So firstly, you can create teams where everything is available to them that they need. So you you, you reduce and eliminate dependencies. the dependencies. Yeah, the dreaded dependencies. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's one. Secondly, um, you get them focused, and this is back to this concept of focus, you get them focused on a few tasks which are important, but which can be completed end to end in a compressed period of time. So uh, we, we were working with a Fidelity um, personal investing. And uh, this was mm -hmm. when Kathy Murphy was running it. And she did this little study of about 100 people in the part of the uh, company that she worked for. And they looked at what they were doing all day long and found a couple of interesting things. So the first thing they found was that on average, the people were working on 10 to 12 mission critical issues at the same time, right? But mm -hmm. everybody's wasn't the same 10 to 12. So that was the first thing. So that you were time shifting all day long. And so your meetings mm -hmm. were not all about one thing. Your time was kind of peanut buttered all over all these tasks. Second thing was the dependency question, which is they were doing things sequentially. You know, so it would start off maybe, a, you know, programming and then maybe it would go to marketing and then maybe it would go to whatever. Um, so things were being done in sequence and sometimes critical information that would have been really, really good to know at the beginning of the process. They didn't get to it till the end. So, you know, you might get all the way down a programming channel before legal would say you can't do that you know, <laughs> or whatever. Um, and then the last thing that they found was that people were very frustrated because, you know, critical information that they knew existed somewhere wasn't available to them to get their jobs done. So they redesigned the organization. Basically, they said, well, OK, what we're going to do is we're going to work in small teams instead of work being allocated to teams, work's going to get pulled in by teams. So we're going to have an agreement mm -hmm. on what are the core objectives that we want to meet here. And then the teams were set free to really work in, in a very single minded way on one or two tasks at a time, time boxed with discrete outcomes along all along the way. And what she found when they reorganized that way was that the time to complete a particular, say, feature on the website was reduced by 75%. So when I say permissionless, I don't mean chaotic. What I mean is you're, you're architecting a set of principles that allow you to have people really close to the customer, really close to your ecosystem, really close to the edges of your organization to make quite substantial decisions without having to get permission from anybody. I love this. This is, is so central to what we teach, what we advocate. You know, there, there, there is in, in, in business, it's called distributed decision making in the military. It's off chugs tactic or, or, or mission command. This, there's a, there's a common realization though that driving decision making as close to the front line, as close to the coal face, as close to the factory floor, as close to the retail register as possible is essential to coping with a world where change happens so rapidly. And, and yet organizations and leaders within organizations struggle so much to do that. And I think that there's, there's a lot, there's several reasons for that. One of which is exactly what you're addressing here, I think, which is they lack the tools to do that. 
The other is they lack, their teams lack the capabilities to do that. They don't have the basic critical thinking and decision-making skills to do that, which is what we've been focused on. Then there's something above both of those things, which is goes back to what we were talking about before the break with the type of qualities that leaders need to cultivate in themselves, which is that leaders need to get comfortable with ambiguity. Leaders, leaders need to get comfortable with uncertainty and, and letting go and trusting their teams to make decisions without having to go back and reference everything to them. And this is, it's, it's a hard thing for leaders to do, but if you get the, the tools like you're talking about in place, and if you develop those cognitive capabilities in your frontline managers that we've been talking about, that should give you the confidence to begin to get comfortable with letting go. Yeah, I, I think I think that's right. And I think the other thing that people don't understand, and this is a particular obsession of mine, which is if you think about a competitive advantage or something that's a success, right, it has a life cycle to it. Um, you know, it begins with innovation or coming up with something new. Then you have this great period of exploitation and then things change and you need to transform the organization. So we teach people really well how to do that exploit thing. And what we leave them empty handed with is how to do the front part, the innovation, the ambiguity, the, you know, crystallizing conditions under uncertainty. And we don't do very, a very good job of teaching them about transformation on the other end. And so what you have is this real skill gap. And the reason I find this so distressing is this is not unknown stuff. <laughs> you know, this right. is like, no. I've been working in this my whole life. There's a whole set of practices and principles that you can use to make this real in your organization. Yeah. And yet, for whatever reason, we're not uh, teaching it. Well, and the, the best leaders have known this. I mean, Patton famously said, don't tell people how to do things. Tell people what needs to be done and let them surprise you with the result. You know, and that's 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 a kind of, uh, you know, English translation of the principle of off tracks tactic, which the which the Germans developed, which is which is allowing the, the leaders at the front lines to make decisions for themselves yeah. without having to go up the chain of command mm -hmm. and. You know, and it's interesting because, you know, we're students of military history. And, and so some of our analogies come from that world. And, you know, people think that the, 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 the Germans dazzled the world with Blitzkrieg because they had tanks and radios and planes, which is true. First, to use those all together. But a, just as big a part of it was this concept of, of off tracks tactic of enabling the frontline leaders to make decisions in the moment. And the 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 an interesting fact that the U.S. researchers determined after the war when they were trying to study why were the Germans, particularly in the beginning of the war, so much more effective than than the Allies, they found that the Germans had the highest casualty rate of officers of any country. Hmm. What why was that significant? Because it showed that that fairly high ranking officers up to general level. We're leading from the front. Mm -hmm. We're at the front. You know, the the the, the classic image is, is Rommel, one of their top generals, you know, in a tank with the hatch open, you know, and at the spearhead of of plowing through France and stuff. And whereas American and British and French generals were hundreds of miles away, you Real know. Yeah. yeah. And and so that has risks, but that's also opportunities. And you know, there's a famous story that, that, you know, the German high command was furious because they didn't know where Rommel was for three days during the invasion of France because he was moving so fast. He didn't have time to set up phone lines to, to report he was back. Busy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and he wasn't having meetings. <laughs> you know, he was yeah, doing exactly. And, and, but we need that type of agility today. Because, because but, yeah. the world, you know, you, you know, I, I've been thinking about this since the break, you know, Every leader now needs to be a wartime leader because the world is changing that rapidly. The challenges, there are so many existential threats that companies are facing right now. I can't think of a single sector, a single industry where if I was running the company, I would be sitting back relaxing right now, feeling confident in the future. I mean, look what's happening in Hollywood right now. I mean, you know, in in the sp in the space of uh, of six months, we've gone from people talking about the golden age of television to talking about the end of Hollywood forever. You know, I mean, that's just one example amongst hundreds of what's going on right now. 
And, and we still haven't begun to see how AI is going to disrupt things, you know, more and more. And so I think you have to cultivate this. Well, Andy Grove said it very well in the 90s, only the paranoid survive. Oh, gosh. I, you know, I, I meant to bring this up earlier when you brought this up. I was such a fan of Andy Grove. You know, I had the pleasure of, of getting to, to meet him a few times. Um, I was a, I was a tech journalist covering, I mean, covered the tech industry in Silicon Valley back, uh, when he was running Intel in the nineties. And, uh, what an amazing leader. And his, his principle of constructive conflict is something that is core to, again, the concept of red teaming, you know, of, of you have to be able to disagree and challenge each other. You have to do so in a constructive and collegial way, though, I think. But you have to be able to do that, you know, and I, and I think back to this, you know, the, 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 the first major multinational company that, that hired me after, after I wrote my book, Red Teaming, the CEO, when I asked him what, why he was interested in bringing me in, said something really interesting. He said, because I rec- I've been with this company as we've gone from being one of dozens of players to being the largest player in our industry. And he said, we used to challenge each other. We used to not be afraid to argue about things. And somehow along the way, at the time they were one of the 15 largest companies in the world, somehow along the way to that journey, we had to, of necessity, become a lot more polite. But we've, we've, we've gone too far, he said. And we've lost the ability to challenge each other. And I want to bring you in and bring red team thinking in because we need to learn how to challenge each other again. The lost art of contradiction. Right. And, and when he said that, you know who I was thinking about in my head was Andy Grove. But what we're seeing here, Rita, is this is what we're talking about. And this is, and you named a, f- a few of the key tools and techniques, is business agility 101. And that came along from the early 2000s, from the agile evolution. And everybody saw that as their silver bullet. Then it was a thing that executives could hang on to, sold by the consultancies, do agile, digital transformations. And yet we're still seeing 20 years in 70% plus failure rates. And when you look at all the data that's coming back, the top reason still sits with leadership. And when you look at why it's fear of the leaders letting go of those reins we talked about to devolve that decision-making responsibility, it's a lack of trust in their people to do what's needed because they're fearful fearful of the knowledge they need to do that. They don't believe their people have it despite having recruited them. And it's these old school behaviors because they're not learning the new requirements. So you get these great programs, these transformations set up, and then they very quickly derail because the reins are being yanked tighter rather than, as you say, permission is released and given to where it should be. And it's still going on. And it's a real dilemma that we're having and we're seeing across many industries and sectors. And it still goes back to that root course. You know, how many of these leaders have, you know, the discipline, the skill, and I love that phrase, the stable in the core. Because if you don't have that, you're never going to be able to release that power that you hold. And it goes back to that power grab, I guess, that many of these executives are still clinging on to. How do they release that? How, how how do you sense or how do you see the leaders, A, creating that inner stable core? Because it, we asked 100 leaders, how many have that? How many really would, truthfully, less than 10%? How do we create that? But then how do we get them to let go and do that thing they fear the most? I know that's a, that's a war and peace question in itself. It's an existential but. question. Um, well, I think the first thing that, that I would observe with respect to the the core, right, is is the only way you're going to improve is seeking out and not letting go of feedback, right? Um, you know, you, you never get better if you don't have these the, the learning loops, right? I mean, we know that human learning is a function of saying, "This is my hypothesis. Reality did not coincide with my hypothesis. Maybe I need a new hypothesis." You know, and, and it's so too with learning, right? You you you. You learn from the unexpected, you learn from surprises. And the only route to growth is you have to take on something that you don't know how to do, see how you do it, practice, get better. And I think there's a lot of work people do need to do on their core. And the first thing they have to do is acknowledge that's necessary. With respect to letting go, I think the 
thing that to me separates out leaders that get comfortable with doing that from those that don't are the ones that have a trusted group of allies, sort of a personal board of directors, people who are there for them in those moments of emotional vulnerability. Um, and, and, you know, people who can give them honest feedback, who break through the bubble wrap that a lot of the senior leaders are wrapped in, uh, who can be honest, who can be candid. And, you know, a lot of leaders avoid that. You know, they don't, they don't want to let people give them counsel. You know, they're not willing to accept feedback or they're not willing to accept negative feedback. And I think part of the problem with the, the higher in a hierarchy that you go is the harder it is for people to be honest with you. And you can't grow if people aren't being honest with you. So you get into these sort of doom loops where these very, very senior people are not hearing what they need to hear to improve personally or to improve the business. Absolutely. There's a, there's a story that, 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 uh, we, we talk about a lot of, uh, that I heard when I was at uh, the command and general staff college about a, a, a three-star general who was being promoted to four-star. And during his pinning on ceremony, the other four-star, since that's the highest rank there is in the, in the U.S. military today, the other four-star who was pinning on his four-star pulled him close and whispered in his ear and said, congratulations. No one's ever going to tell you the truth again. And, and this guy became one of the big advocates for red teaming in the military because he realized that the only way that he was ever going to get the truth as a senior leader again was to create processes, to create mechanisms for getting people to challenge things, for getting people to tell him disconfirming things and stuff like that. Because otherwise, people are just going to tell him what 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 he wanted yeah. to hear. Yeah. And, and this is a frustration from the front lines, isn't it? When you go and talk to those frontline teams who are trying to make those decisions, if they're relaying bad news upwards to you know, escalate the problems and then they meet the CEO one day and talk about it and the CEO is oblivious. Mm -hmm. And because that bad news has gone through the rose tinted filters, we used to call it the kernel filter in the military, but you see it in organizations, <laughs> each management layer will dilute the bad news because they don't want to be the harbinger of doom or the harbinger of the, you know, this is a real problem, the, the reds that we talk about with Alan mm -hmm. and everything suddenly becomes green again. Mm -hmm. And then when the CEO gets to the coal face, it's like, Hey, why am, I, why am I surrounded by all these problems? Why haven't I been made aware of this? Exactly. And it goes back to what you said, Rita. If you've got that cadre of capable people around you who are willing to call you out, willing to tell you the hard truths that you need to hear and not keep telling you the lies that you want to hear, that's what makes a leader trustworthy. And that inner confidence to say, okay, off you go, do this. Mm -hmm. And because I'm getting told things, but when you start finding out information that you're three, four, five layers below you, have prevented from arriving at your desk, that sets a whole different mindset about how you work with those individuals, what problems are much broader than what you think sit outside your office. So, so I'll have to share with you a great example of a leader who was acutely aware of this. Um, this was Gisbert Rule, and he was the CEO of a German metals services company called Klockner. And a terrible business, right? So you're caught in the middle between these huge steel producers and metal producers and this sort of fragmented rats and mice group of customers that you're trying to serve. And so the whole supply chain was a nightmare. Anyway, his solution was he wanted to do a digital transition, you know, really, really bring the whole sector into the modern age by doing a digital thing. But his big concern, well, he had many concerns, but one of his big concerns was that his message would be diluted by his middle managers, that they would prefer not to change. They wanted to hang on to the old way of doing things. Yeah. And so what he decided to do was install what he calls non-hierarchical communication, which for a German company, this is a big deal. So he bought an instance of Yammer and gave it to everybody in the company. And he said, look, if there's anything happening in any part of the company that you think I would benefit from knowing about, I want you to send me a text through this Yammer yeah. thing. And now this was, I mean, this was revolutionary on many, many levels. Um, and what he did when he first installed it was he dedicated two hours every day to being on that system. And he further instructed his IT people to put any message that came from someone who was sort of lower in the hierarchy to invert the hierarchy so that a message that got priority would be from a person who was not hierarchically an important person. And he would respond. And the interesting thing about his response is like, so say somebody wrote him about, about, about a problem that really should not have existed. It was a result of sloppiness or whatever. He would never take... Uh, a, a sanction for the, the leadership chain up and down. What he would do instead is he'd say, ah, you know, we're so glad you brought this to the surface. Perhaps there's some way 
that we can come up with a solution that everyone agrees would make sense. But no kind of punishment. It wasn't what like that. And people got the idea. And then what happened was people started to talk to each other. So this became almost an information spine for this kind of very honest, transparent communication up and down the organization. It's really an interesting technique. But, you know, I love that idea. But there's a there's there's a there's a there's a caveat with it, which is you have to listen. Oh yeah, yeah, right. Because mm -hmm. I, I I was working with a South Korean conglomerate, who the CEO had the same idea, little same thing, except he was going to use use uh, uh, the the private version of Facebook. I can't remember what it's called that companies can use. But the problem is, is that every time somebody told him, "Here's what's going wrong," he'd attack them and say. You don't know what you don't. Yeah. You only see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not. The that's way. the danger. That's why those things are a one shot. And you get it wrong on the first shot, right? There's no second shot. It's dead. But the power of that same with surveys, isn't it? You know, you put a survey out to 100 people. They provide you the feedback. Nothing changes. You put it out the next time. You get 50 responses. You put it out the third time. They get 20 responses. Then they're frustrated that nobody's responding. Mm -hmm. right. If you put that survey out and respond effectively, you know, you said we did. People go, all right, I've been heard. And that, that's ultimately all people want in an organization, which goes back to the permissionless awesomeness. People want to be heard. People have great ideas. And as we say, most of the answers you require rest within your organization. So if you're that C-suite, if you're that leadership individual who's unsure or doesn't know, just ask. Put the message out. Ask for input, advice, ideas. And if they surface and people see them surfaced and listen to, that is then the bow wave that is quickly followed by a tsunami of huge innovation, huge engagement. I mean, you look at the, the responses now, 21% engagement in the workforce, which is sickeningly low. It's awful. Really bad. You know, but yeah. yeah. And but, what, we find, what we find with these organizations that operate in this permissionless way, um, much more engagement. You know, much more willingness yeah. to go the extra mile, you know, much more of that yeah. um, because people really feel that they're they they own this. Right. There's a sense of ownership. Well, that's the thing is, you know, as, as Marcus is saying, I mean, most people don't get up in the morning wanting to do a crappy yeah. job at work. Yeah. They want to make a difference. They want to you know, they want to find fulfillment in doing their best. But what what kicks the stool out from under Neath a lot of people every day is going to work and, and, and feeling like nobody wants them to do their best and it doesn't matter if they do their best. And if they do their best, it's not going to make any difference anyway. So why bother? <laughs> and so, you know, just, just having, I love that example you shared, Rhea. I'm going to, I'm going to learn more about that, but just having that, that, that conversation with your teams, with your employees is so powerful. And, you know, I think that's something that every leader, at every level of every organization can do and can start doing today, can start doing tomorrow. And they don't need to wait. They don't need to ask for permission to do this. So I hope if nothing, if, if folks, if you don't take anything else away from this, I hope you take that away from this. This is so much to, to, to think about, but that's a big one. So Bryce, can I, can I add one more thing just to build on that thought, which is, um, you know, one of the things I think that gets in the way is the they problem, right? I mean, I've had this all the way up to the C-suite in a major corporation. When they start talking about they, they mean the board. And I'm like, if you guys can make yes. this happen. Yes, so always then it went up. <laughs> so, yep. so, you know, what I would encourage people to do is stop using that as a crutch, right? If, if you're not operating in an agile way, wherever you are, if you're not operating in a way that is respectful of people and, you know, gives them power and lets people do their best work every day, then, you know, that's, that's on you, <laughs> right? hundred percent, Rita. Yeah, and I don't think you can let, you know, the, the excuse that, well, they won't do it. Because the most enduring changes operate from groundswells of shift, mm -hmm. you know, up, bottoms up, up, right? Amen. We yeah. were, Marcus and I were teaching a class yesterday, and this came up in the class. One of our students said, you know, I love what you're teaching, but in my organization, you know, my boss doesn't want to hear anything that challenges the status quo and stuff. And, and so I can't use any of this stuff. And, and, and my response was, you can use this with your team, though. Yeah. You can. You don't yeah. need your boss's permission to use this with your team. And here's the thing that will happen if you use this with your team. I guarantee you that people will start to say, well, what's going on on John's team here? Why Why are they doing better than everyone else? What is What are they doing that no one else is doing? Mm -hmm. 
and people will just start to get curious. And, and it's not going to happen overnight necessarily, but people will say, well, what, why aren't we doing that then? You know, and, and I just think, Rita, what you said is so important is, is getting rid of the day problem. And I, 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 I'm sure you, you deal with this in your, in your consulting work. We deal with, with probably the number one thing we hear from clients. So I'd love to do this, but they won't let me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Could I, could I also build on something else that I think is important there? So if you think about your organizational systems, right, you have one right. system which we've inherited from the world of Frederick <laughs> Taylor, um, yeah. which is really about the now system, right? It's operate exactly, mm-hmm. be precise, do what you're supposed to do, minimize variance, blah, 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 blah. And we've got all kinds of metrics and rules around how that's supposed to be executed. What yep. we need is a complementary but equally powerful and equally rule enforced system for the next, right? What, what's your company going to be next? What's your organization going to be next? So imagine a conversation with a lawyer who's operating in sort of that first system and you say, can we do this? Right. And the lawyer says, no, it's not legal, right? Imagine in the second system, if the conversation instead becomes, uh, hey, Here's what I want to accomplish. Can you help me design an approach that would allow me to do that legally? All of a sudden, you've got a completely different conversation happening. Now you're like, oh, well, you know, if you do this, but if you do it in that sequence, I think we could maybe get away with this and that could make it work. You're opening up possibilities. And so if you think about the people that enforce rules in a company, if the only rules they have are the rules of the now system to work with, that's what they're going to enforce. But if you give them rules around the next system, like don't don't ask for a yes or no, ask for how might we, right? And if that becomes the rule, mm-hmm. all those rule enforcer people will now enforce those rules. And so I think what we need to be mindful of is installing some of these next system practices throughout the organization, because then you're, you know, the people that enforce the rules have a new set of rules they can enforce. And what I think is important for people to realize is, we think of this sort of innovation next discovery processes as being undisciplined. You know, Steve Jobs arrives at a clamshell in a black turtleneck and iPhones. Have, it's not like that, right? Rising from San Francisco Bay. It's, yeah, right. You know, it's, I mean, but it's hard work. It's discipline. And there is an actual discipline to it. It's rock rib discipline. But what you want is all your rule enforcers to be able to enforce those rules as much and where it's appropriate as the people that are enforcing the, the existing system rules. I love that, Rita. That is so true. Rita, how can people learn more about you and your work? Me? Well, I have a website, very creatively called RitaMcGrath.com. Um, and you can read, um, I publish regular articles. They're called Thought Sparks every, every, pretty much every week. Um, so you can subscribe to those. I also have a YouTube channel where I post uh, interviews like this done of all kinds of artists and entrepreneurs and authors and, and so forth. And then I have a sister company to the Rita McGrath group. So if you think about Rita McGrath, that's all about writing books and articles and thinking. And I, some years back, uh, got involved with a company called Belize, which is around implementation. So it's around how do I take those great ideas and make them a reality in my organization? Excellent. Well, we'll put links to all of that in the show notes. Thank you so much for joining us today, Rita. Thank you, Rita. Oh, what a pleasure. Wonderful to meet you. Nice to meet you and to be continued, I hope.